Hello everybody, I'm Chris Morosky, and this video is on preeclampsia, and it's part of our Basic Science Conference Series. The goals and objectives of this video are as follows. Discuss the workup and management of a patient presenting with preeclampsia. Review initial prenatal labs and why they are tested. Understand fetal biometry and amniotic fluid index measurements. Describe in detail the basic science pathophysiology of preeclampsia. We're going to start this video off learning by our patient, SJ. SJ is a 19-year-old African-American G1P0 who presents for a routine follow-up prenatal visit at 26 weeks and 3 days. Her main complaint is a progressively worsening headache over the past 2-3 to three days. What are the routine parts of her prenatal care that you would want to review in her chart prior to seeing her today? What specific follow-up questions do you have about her headache? It's important to note that the patients in the Basic Science Conference Series are presenting to the office for prenatal visits. These visits are often approximately 15 minutes in length. Your evaluation, physical exam, and presentations are going to want to be succinct. They should be much more concise than an initial H&P on a new prenatal patient or a patient being admitted to labor and delivery in labor. In this video, we're going to review a certain part of routine prenatal care called initial labs. In this video, we're going to review what are initial labs and why we draw them. First, a patient's blood type and screen will be drawn. A patient's blood type will not change, but our antibody screen can. Things that change your antibody screen include blood transfusions, solid organ transfusion, and pregnancy. So following every single pregnancy, a blood type and screen must be drawn. We also check a complete blood count. It's important to note that the patient will have some degree of anemia of pregnancy. We want to know where she is starting off in terms of her hemoglobin hematocrit. Also, gestational thrombocytopenia is common at the end of pregnancy, and it's important to know her baseline platelet count. The next four labs are drawn because they can cross to the baby and cause congenital infections. These include HIV, syphilis, or RPR, rubella, and hepatitis B. These will stand out as obvious torch infections, but there are certain infections that aren't on the list here, and it might make you wonder why. These next infections are listed here as missing torch infections. The reason that these aren't tested for during pregnancy is that they are not reliable in terms of congenital infection, and also we use public health initiatives to try to decrease the probability that a patient will be infected with these during her pregnancy. First, cytomegalovirus. Most adults actually have been exposed to cytomegalovirus previously in their lives, usually when they were children. Testing for cytomegalovirus is not predictive of congenital infection. We recommend that women avoid the urine and saliva of young children. This would go for anybody who works with young children or in healthcare settings, and also women with young children. There's a lot of hand washing that we recommend in pregnancy to avoid congenital cytomegalovirus infection. Toxoplasmosis infection in pregnancy is avoided by having women not change the cat litter box. Zika virus isn't on the original torch infection list. However, this can cross to the baby and cause congenital infection. We advise women to avoid travel to Zika active countries. Finally, Listeria. Listeria is a bacteria that lives in animal intestines and can get into the meat when they're slaughtered. In order to avoid congenital Listeria infection, we recommend women avoid deli meats or cook deli meats to 145 degrees Fahrenheit before eating them. We also recommend that they avoid any unpasteurized soft cheese. Alright, back to our list of initial labs. We also screen women for gonorrhea and chlamydia at the initial visit. These two infections are spread sexually, but however, do not tend to cause pelvic inflammatory disease during pregnancy as the gestation is in the way. Importantly, women should be treated for these sexually transmitted infections as they can pass it on to their partner. Also, it's important to screen for women in the third trimester for these infections, as during the labor process, these can cause severe congenital infection and blindness in the babies. Women who test positive for gonorrhea or chlamydia in the first trimester should have a third trimester screen for gonorrhea and chlamydia, as should women who have high-risk sexual practices. Also, we check for urine culture at the initial visit. Due to changes in pregnancy, women are 20 times more likely to get pyelonephritis from asymptomatic bacteria compared to women who are not pregnant. In some offices, you will see a part of the routine practice is to screen women for drugs of abuse. There is some controversy over this, but this is something that you may see on your rotations. Finally, pregnancy is not a reason to avoid pap testing and cervical cancer screening. 
If a woman is due for a pap test, she should have this performed during her initial visit. All right, there's a pretty good review of our initial prenatal labs and why we test for them. Moving on, let's briefly discuss headaches in pregnancy. It's important to distinguish common causes of headache in adults, as well as pregnancy concerns for preeclampsia. The more common headaches in adults include migraine headaches, tension headaches, and cluster headaches. The following characteristics help us differentiate between these types of headaches. First, the location. Migraine headaches tend to be unilateral, whereas tension type are bilateral. Cluster headaches are almost always unilateral. They usually begin around the eye or the temple. Migraine headaches tend to be gradual and onset with a crescendo pattern, and they are often pulsating. Tension type headaches feel like pressure or tightness, and cluster headaches begin very quickly and reach a crescendo very quickly. The pain is deep and continuous. For patients with a migraine headache, they prefer usually to be in a dark, quiet room. Patients with tension type headache may either be resting or active, and patients with cluster headaches are usually active. Migraine headaches come on over 4 to 72 hours, whereas tension type headaches are usually like 30 minutes to many days, and cluster headaches are very quickly, 15 minutes to 3 hours. Patients with migraine headaches may have nausea, vomiting, and photophobia, whereas there's really no other associated symptoms with tension type headache. And patients with cluster headaches may have increased lacrimation, redness of the eye, stuffy nose, and other nasal symptoms. Moving on to preeclampsia, the associated symptoms that we see with preeclampsia include scotomena, which is visual changes that look like flashing lights in front of the eyes, nausea and vomiting, right upper quadrant epigastric pain, shortness of breath, and chest pain. Okay, let's move on and see how SJ did with her pertinent positives. On further review of HPI and reviewer systems, she notes that her headache is throughout her head, it is off and on, it is 4 to 7 out of 10 in severity, she has no worsening or alleviating factors, and no improvement with Tylenol. She has no scotomena, no right upper quadrant pain, and no nausea or vomiting. Importantly here, I'm including the review of systems that you should ask for every pregnant patient every time you have an encounter with her. The patient reports positive fetal movement, negative vaginal bleeding, no contractions, and no leaking fluid from the vagina. Her prenatal course is so far uncomplicated. She had normal initial labs and no pap smear was done. Again, she is under the age of 21 and does not require cervical cancer screening yet. She had normal first and second trimester ultrasound with a negative NIPT and AFP. Please see our gestational diabetes basic science conference video for more information on genetic screening in pregnancy. The patient has not had a glucola or 28 week labs yet. In terms of her history, she's overall healthy. She's had no prior surgeries or medical diagnosis. She's a never smoker and she's a college freshman who's still in school. Her family history is that the patient herself was born at 28 weeks due to preeclampsia. What part of the physical exam would you want to perform today? Again, keep in mind that this patient is presenting for a routine prenatal visit and your exam is usually limited. However, this patient, you may want to consider additional exam findings. The physical exam that you should perform today would include the following. Vital signs and general appearance, a urine dipstick, and we consider that part of the exam for a prenatal patient, a heart and lung exam, fetal heart tones, and fundal height, as routine for every prenatal visit, and a limited neuro exam to include upper and lower extremity deep tendon reflexes, as well as clonus at the ankle. All right, here are the physical exam findings for our patient, SJ. Vital signs, the patient is five feet, three inches tall, and 143 pounds. Her blood pressure is 164 over 102, her heart rate is 72, respiratory rate 17, and her temperature is 98.7 degrees Fahrenheit. On a urine dipstick, she has negative ketones, negative white blood cells, 2 plus protein, and negative glucose. On general appearance, she's alert, oriented, no apparent distress. Her cardiovascular exam is regular rate and rhythm with a normal S1 and S2. Her lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. Her fundal height is 22 centimeters. Her fetal heart tones is 146 beats per minute. On lower extremities, they are non-tender with no edema, and she has 2 plus reflexes bilaterally with no clonus. All right, now is the time to spend your money. What additional testing would you want to order for this patient? The additional testing you would want to order on this patient would include a second and third trimester ultrasound. This patient's fundal height is severely lagging behind her gestational age. You would want to check the growth of the baby, and make sure there's enough amniotic fluid around the baby. In terms of lab work, we would want to check a CBC, AST and ALT, BUN and creatinine, and uric acid. Finally, the patient would be sent to collect a 24-hour urine protein 
or you can have a urine P to C ratio performed on a small sample of urine today. Before we go over the results of the additional testing for our patient SJ, I want to quickly review fetal biometry and amniotic fluid index measurements. First, fetal biometry. Fetal biometry is the use of ultrasound to measure certain parts of the baby in order to estimate its fetal weight. The first measurement is head circumference. It is important to measure head circumference in the right plane of the fetal head. In the very middle of this ultrasound image of a fetal head, you can see a white line that goes across the fetal head. This is the falx cerebri. It is important to have the same amount of the fetal brain on either side of the falx cerebri. Surrounding the falx cerebri is a small dark area which we often refer to as butterfly wings, and that is the thalamus. This ultrasound measurement is taken approximately at the level of the parietal bones. The shape of the fetal head at this level should be an oval. The head circumference measurement is taken all the way around the outside of the bone. In this next image, we show the biparietal diameter. Again, the original image was taken at the level of the parietal bones. The biparietal diameter measurement is taken from the outside of the anterior portion of the fetal skull, or that which is on top, all the way down to the inside of the posterior part of the fetal skull, all the way down to the bottom. The next measurement is the abdominal circumference. This again needs to be taken at a very particular location in the baby's abdomen. You can see the fetal spine at approximately 10 o'clock and a single rib coming off in either direction. The dark circle at 2 o'clock is the fetal stomach. The dark collection at approximately 4 o'clock and in the middle of the ultrasound picture is the portal system of the liver. A proper abdominal circumference is usually a round circle. Again, the measurement is taken all around the outside of the abdomen. A long bone measurement is taken for calculation of estimated fetal weight. Normally this is the femur length. Importantly, the length of the femur needs to be taken from where the femur flares out on either end. You can see the little sharp pointy flare on the right side, as well as the beginning of a flare on the left side. The entire femur should be measured. It is important to note that the humerus will look very similar to the femur. If your ultrasound measurements are normal, and you end up with a very, very short femur length, it may be possible that you've measured the humerus. All right, so all of those measurements go into fetal biometry and added up together, they can predict an adjusted ultrasound age and estimated fetal weight. Next, we're gonna briefly review amniotic fluid index. Amniotic fluid index is a much more straightforward procedure. This is something that I believe medical students can do, again, with patient permission and supervision. In order to perform an amniotic fluid index, the maternal abdomen is divided up into four quadrants. The deepest pocket of amniotic fluid is detected on ultrasound. This pocket is measured directly anterior to posterior. The measurements are in centimeters. The four measurements are added together to calculate an amniotic fluid index. Amniotic fluid index value 0 to 5 centimeters is considered oligohydramnios. AFI value 6 to 25 centimeters are normal and AFI values greater than 25 centimeters are considered polyhydramnios. Looking at the image to the left, the top left ultrasound picture has a quadrant measurement of 7.14 centimeters. The top right measurement is 7.61 centimeters. The bottom right measurement is 7.53 centimeters, and the bottom left measurement is 8.58 centimeters. All added up, this patient has an amniotic fluid index over 30 and has polyhydramnios. All right, that's a very brief review of biometry and amniotic fluid index measurements and calculations. Let's look and see what our results are for our patient, SJ. Here is SJ's further workup. On transabdominal ultrasound, SJ is found to have a viable singleton intrauterine pregnancy in the vertex presentation. The fetal heartbeat is 141 beats per minute. She has a grade two anterior placenta with no previa. On growth measurements, her head circumference is 23 weeks and two days. Biparietal diameter is 23 weeks and 4 days. Abdominal circumference is 21 weeks and 1 day. And the femur length is 22 weeks and 3 days. The adjusted ultrasound age is 22 weeks and 6 days, and this is less than 5th percentile for her gestational age. Her amniotic fluid measurements are quadrant 1, 2.1 centimeters, quadrant 2, 1.1 centimeters, quadrant 3, 3.5 centimeters, and quadrant 4, 0 0.6 centimeters. This makes her AFI 7.3 centimeters. Her hemoglobin is 11.8, her hematocrit is 34.2, and her platelet count is 189,000. Her AST and ALT are both normal. Her BUN, creatinine, and uric acid are also normal. A 
24-hour urine protein collection reveals 676 milligrams of total protein. Adding up her severe range blood pressures with this degree of proteinuria and growth restriction of the baby, you would diagnose este with severe preeclampsia or preeclampsia with severe features. What we will do next is review the basic science and pathophysiology of preeclampsia. Here is your proposed basic science assignment related to the pathophysiology of preeclampsia. Diagram the roles of SFLT1, nitric oxide, endoglin, and VGF in preeclampsia and how these can affect the growth of the baby. Very importantly, it is thought that poor trophoblastic spiral artery invasion is the first step in the pathophysiologic cause of preeclampsia. This causes the spiral arteries to maintain a high vascular resistance and eventually leads to placental ischemia. Placental ischemia leads to an increase in SFLT production. SFLT is a truncated form of the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor FLT1. This makes SFLT a competitive inhibitor of the VGF receptor. SFLT therefore antagonizes vascular endothelial growth factor and also antagonizes placental growth factor. Decreases in the vascular endothelial growth factor also leads to a decrease in prostacyclin, which has important anti-inflammatory actions. This decrease in prostacyclin leads to endothelial cell dysfunction, and therefore there is a decreased endothelial production of nitric oxide. Placental ischemia also causes elevated levels of endoglin. Endoglin impairs binding of TGF-beta to its receptors and downstream signaling, including effects on activation of nitric oxide production and vasodilation. Okay, now let's put this all together. As you can see, the decreased endothelial nitric oxide production, as well as the decrease in vascular endothelial growth factor and placental growth factor, leads to poor placental growth and perfusion. And this all leads to growth restriction in the infant. Wow, that was a lot of basic science right there. But in clinical research, investigators are looking at measuring SFLT and endoglin levels, as well as Doppler ultrasound of the uterine arteries, as ways to predict preeclampsia in our patients right now as we speak. Also, research is underway to see if SFLT blockers may help prevent some of the effects of preeclampsia later in pregnancy. All right, let's move on to propose a management plan for this patient. What would be your management plan for a 19-year-old G1P0 presenting with preeclampsia with severe features at 26 weeks and 3 days? Given the fact that she has severe range blood pressures, proteinuria greater than 300 milligrams in a 24-hour urine collection, and growth restriction of her fetus, the patient would normally be admitted to the hospital. In the hospital, she would undergo continuous fetal monitoring and at least daily non-stress testing. Steroids such as betamethasone would be given to the mother to advance fetal lung maturity in the fetus. The patient would be started on intravenous magnesium sulfate for seizure prophylaxis, and she'd be given antihypertensives to lower her blood pressure. This could be done with either IV labetalol, IV hydralazine, or oral nifedipine. If the patient were to remain stable and not have worsening blood pressures or other symptoms of worsening severe preeclampsia, she could be monitored in the hospital very closely. Close hospital monitoring would include weekly growth ultrasounds and umbilical artery Doppler. The patient would be delivered for worsening preeclampsia, fetal distress, and if there was no growth in the fetus over one to two weeks time. All right, everybody, that about wraps up this video on preeclampsia. Let's take a peek at the goals and objectives and see if we met them all. Our goals and objectives are as follows. Discuss the workup and management of a patient presenting with preeclampsia. Review initial prenatal labs and why they are tested. Understand fetal biometry and amniotic fluid index measurements. Describe in detail the basic science and pathophysiology of preeclampsia. Looks like we did a very good job. Thanks for watching this video. Good luck with your studies, and we'll see you around, everybody. Bye-bye.